To his left um, at the end is uh, Bob Hewish, who is an assistant professor, professor in international development studies at Dalhousie University. And he um, has a background in geography, so you're going to hear the, the lens of geography uh, streaming throughout some of his conversations today. A lot of his work has looked at uh, global health specifically and also at social activism and how that can lead to um, larger development outcomes and how that uh, can address global health uh, inequity. And that what is the role of activism in bringing about improved provision of health care in resource poor settings. His work has been uh, quite broad geographically, but often draws back onto the work and the influence in, uh, in Cuba, particularly in uh, the Cuban medical internationalism. So we're going to hear multiple lenses of, uh, of Bob's, Bob's work uh, here today. And K Carol is up now, right? Okay. Well, f first off, thanks for having me here. This is really a tremendous opportunity for me to speak with you. And I've been here two hours, and I feel like I've met half a dozen old friends. So this is really a lot of fun. I really appreciate the conference organizers and the opportunity to, to be here. I'm going to try to tie a few things together. I'm also going to try to be brief so that we have enough time for conversation on a lot of the concepts and issues we've, we've discussed. I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural collision in global health training. This is my disclosure, and I didn't need this disclosure to tell me that global health was really a passion for me. Um, but when you see that you have no research support, no speakers bureau, no consulting fees, I guess it just reinforces that it's a passion. <laughs> so it was about 15 years ago that I returned from a two-week global health experiential learning trip in Honduras. I was a medical student at the time at Duke University. It was a part of a global health program there. And since that time, these programs in global health learning, experiential learning, have really increased. They've done nothing but increase. By some estimates, about 200,000 Americans go abroad as part of short-term medical outreach each year. As many as one-third of U.S. medical students, two-thirds of students plan to do it during their tenure. It's very easy to find stories like these where Advice is offered on how medical students and trainees can choose short-term experiences in global health. And it's been during these 15 years that I've become part of what I think is really an incredible interdisciplinary movement that's critically examining the short-term experience, trying to understand how to make it better, and dare I say, in some ways, trying to lay the foundation for a world where these programs aren't even necessary in the first place. So it was around the time of my experience in Honduras that one of my philosophy professors in graduate school shared with me this book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. Many of you are probably familiar with it. It tells the story of a Hmong family who experiences clear cultural differences, a cultural collision, some might say, between their culture and modern medicine and the medical profession. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, I certainly encourage you to. And why do I bring it up here? Well, I bring it up because I think in the short-term global health context, the issue of cultural differences is probably the most common issue that trainees like myself experience. It's arguably the most important issue that trainees experience, and it's perhaps one of the most vexing, as you'll see in some of the slides and frameworks I present. So today, what I really want to discuss is a specific instance of this general problem of cultural differences, and that's one that relates to gender. I think it would help to start with a real world and complex scenario, the type of scenario that forms the basis of the cases that we've developed to teach in a pre-departure setting, trainees about ethics and global health. I'll talk about this in a workshop later. These are real scenarios, but just so you're aware, we've changed the details to protect privacy. We've combined some of the cases so that it makes for a better educational experience. But in any case, I want you to know that the details are real. And this is just a screenshot from our online curriculum. So let me read it out. Jane is a trainee working in a foreign hospital in a global health program. She prepared for cultural competency by learning about how to greet and address others, such as handshake customs. While in country, she becomes friends with another American, Ryan, and has dinner with him. Later, she learns from her advisor that single men and women do not have dinner alone in this particular culture. She wonders if she should conform to this norm even after hours, when she's not on hospital time as part of her short-term experience. 
Now imagine Jane is asked to wear a burqa while in the clinic, and she cannot address men directly. She feels uncomfortable with adhering to this particular cultural norm. Moreover, needing a male intermediary for conversations is going to slow down the number of patients she sees and will hinder her health education project, the project she's conducting as part of her time abroad. So she knows now that she will not achieve the goals she has for this particular program. Finally, when Jane returns, she tells you this story, and this too is a real story that comes from some of the focus groups we've run with trainees who come back and share their experiences. Getting consent from a patient usually took a formal kind of consent from the husband, but sometimes the husband was not at home. Then the women who were more than 18 years of age gave the consent. But then when the husband came to know about this, there were two cases, the women were beaten by their husband because she talked with the interviewers with Jane. So here we have a bunch of different norms, differences in culture, handshakes, dinner rituals, dress, power imbalances related to gender. And intuitively, I think we consider these differences somewhat differently. They seem to exist along some sort of a spectrum. We might ask ourselves who's right, which culture is right, or perhaps in this cartoon, as this cartoon suggests, perhaps no one is right. If you can't see the writing on the cartoon, the woman on the left is wearing a bikini and sunglasses, and she's saying everything towards the other woman, everything is covered. Um, what a male dominated, except her eyes, what a male dominated culture. The woman on the right is saying, nothing covered except her eyes. What a male dominated culture. So what are, how do we make sense of these differences in cultural norms, differences that trainees like Jane or myself might experience in the context of short-term global health training? Well, this is where ethics lenses come in. I like to think of ethics, um, although there are many disciplines of ethics and many theories and concepts of ethics, I like to think of them as lenses unified under words like ought, should, and so on, that can help us make sense of these situations, both individually the level of Jane, that for, it can help Jane make sense of this situation, and also collectively as we think about this work within a broader context. And in fact, if we were to look for ethics guidance, we would see that there are ethics guidelines out there specific to the short-term context, short-term global health training experiences. These, these are the WAIT guidelines, the working group on ethics guidelines for global health training, and in 2010 they published a set of recommended best practices and ethics guidelines for short-term work. Not surprisingly, culture and cultural differences is one part of the guidelines. So they say that programs should develop, implement, regularly update, and improve formal training for trainees and mentors, both local and foreign, regarding material that includes cultural competence. For example, behavior, local and sending, and dealing effectively with cultural differences. They also recommend dealing appropriately with conflicts, the kind of conflicts that Jane's experiencing in terms of professionalism, culture, scientific and clinical differences of approach. But what does it mean to deal appropriately with conflicts? What does that mean for Jane with these differences in gender and these differences in culture um, that maybe are unique in their own way? So one of the things that we've talked about in our work, and this is not something that's in the cases that we teach, but it's something when we expand on them, um, is this framework. And let me spend a couple minutes going through it. First, let me point out that we call it in, in, in this framework cultural understanding because, to be frank, I don't quite understand what it means to be competent in a culture. And so we choose not to use that terminology. We think understanding is a better, better goal. And so if you look at this framework along the x-axis, you have difficulty of accommodation. That is, how difficult it is to accommodate a particular difference in cultural norms. On the y-axis, you have moral gravity. That is, how serious the particular norm is. And if we start in the lower left box, you'll see that there's a low difficulty of accommodation and a low moral gravity. An example here might be differences in handshake, clear issues where we probably think you should respect the local culture. On the other end of the spectrum, in the upper right, is where difficulty of accommodation is high. It's very difficult for Jane or others to accommodate a particular difference in norms. And also the norm itself actually has significant, what I would describe as moral gravity. It's a really serious norm. Radical gender differences would fall into this category. And then as you can imagine, on each of the other quadrants in this two by two, there are norms that are 
very difficult to accommodate, but yet may not be significant from the standpoint of moral gravity. This might be gender-specific education. If Jane is conducting an education program that has to be targeted to one gender or the other. And then, of course, there's the upper left, which is just the, the last box left over. Not very difficult to accommodate, but significant, significant in terms of the moral gravity. We might think about certain modes of address or clothes and attire as falling into this category. Pretty easy to change what you wear. Pretty easy for Jane to wear the burqa, but it may be pretty significant from the standpoint of the moral gravity. And I won't comment in much detail, but I'll just add that there is another access that comes in and out of the screen, an access out in and out of the screen, which has to do with whether it's on personal time or professional time. If you remember in one of the scenarios, Jane wondered whether because she was after hours, did she have to abide by the particular cultural norm by not having dinner with Ryan? I have thoughts on that. Perhaps it'll come up in discussion too. But you might ask, well, this, this is great. It starts to help us think about ethics and differences in culture and differences in gender, but does it just kick the can down the road? Because what really factors in to what I've described as moral gravity? What does that mean? So here again, we can use the le ethics lenses, the language, the concepts of ethics to help us think through what moral gravity might mean. So we have specific concepts or principles, the specific meanings and examples that might occur in this setting. So principle number one, humility. This means in general, acknowledging one's own limitations. And here I think the most important example is asking the question, do I know the meaning of a particular practice? Do I know it? Am I in the position, is Jane in the position, to know the meaning of a particular cultural practice? Respect, demonstrating concern for others' dignity. The application might be in general, should I or Jane defer to local custom when cultures are different and norms are different? Then there's beneficence, acting to benefit others. Will accommodating this particular norm or not accommodating the norm increase the good that is done in the course of this program? Where good is defined, I should say, quite broadly. This isn't short-term impact necessarily, but good in a very broad sense. We could talk about that in discussion too. Autonomy, freedom to choose. Are my or my other's actions freely chosen? Whether it's the individual who's visiting or is, is it the individual who's in the community where the person is visiting? And finally, justice, equity, perhaps tying together some of the concepts of the panel related to gender and ethics and equity here. Justice, of course, is complex, but it, at the very least means fair treatment. And a, a pertinent example in this case is if we only go for short-term work to places where our norms agree, what about others in need? There will always be places where norms disagree, and what about the suffering in those places? Are they left out because we're too committed to our own cultural and moral norms? So this is a way, I think, to start thinking about moral gravity in the setting of cultural differences, specifically with related to gender, but the problem, of course, is bigger than that. So this cultural competency, again, I'll just say is one case, cultural understanding is one case in our introductory curriculum. Um, you can see there are nine other cases there. We'll talk about this in the workshop later today, but cultural understanding is, is one of them. I still think, and I hope for the discussion, there are many unanswered questions that come up in this context. Should some gender norms or other norms that differ be tolerated for the sake of longer term change? And if so, which ones? Which ones are tolerable? When, if ever, this is a big question that programs often face when we talk with short term programs, when, if ever, do gender norms differ enough to end or not even start a collaboration? And are there principles, such as human rights principles, I'm glad that Carol brought that up, that transcend these cultural differences? Is there a way to use the language, the concepts, the principles of human rights to transcend and come up with a language that we can all share to discuss cultural differences or gender differences? And then finally, taking it back to Jane or myself, the trainee that experiences this type of tension, how can we better support trainees who experience these differences in culture while they're abroad? So I thank you for your time and thanks again for the opportunity to speak.